Anybody? Yes, sir. Good evening. Okay, 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 good. So, good evening. So, let's start our class for today. And today, we are moving forward. So, what we have done in in the last the last three weeks, I've had three classes with you guys. What we have done is to set background for financial reporting, to look at regulatory and conceptual framework. And like I've told you in the last class, this part of your syllabus, that part that we learned in your syllabus, I've told you is 10%. It's so important. It's extremely important. And if you go and check your past questions, or if you have read the material we sent to you on those two topics, you will have seen that it's an area I can ask almost every diet. And because it is theoretical, it's, it, it's a bit easier to, to pick points from those areas. All you just need to do is just to ensure you read those materials and you'll be fine. Now, we are moving away from that now. Today, we are going to start entering accounting standards. And the first accounting standard I'll be teaching you is IS1 on presentation of financial statements. And basically, what I need you to know here is, is not every part of the note I've sent to you. I would focus on certain areas that you would um, really need to understand very well. Because all I want to teach you here basically is for now, for you to understand the structure and the content of the financial statements. That is the focus of this class on IES 1. So the part of IES 1 I want to teach you is for you to understand the structure and the content. Well, according to IES 1, that's the third point here. The structure and the content of this of this standard of of this of of a financial statement so so firstly if you look through this note you'll see some definition of financial statements there i won't go through that again because indirectly we have learned that when we did conceptual framework so the first thing i'll be looking at today is a complete set of a financial statement or something we otherwise call um, the component of a financial statement. And when we talk about the component of a financial statement, the first one is here is a statement of financial position. And after the statement of financial position, we have the statement of profit or loss. And after the statement of profit or loss, there is statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. And after that, we have the statement of cash flows. We have the statement of changes in equity. Then we have the notes. Notes. You see, this sixth one is not something we will look at here, which is an, an opening statement of financial position for the earliest comparative period. So I don't think you should really pay your attention on this. What we would look at critically in this class are these five. Are these five. And the first class I took you guys, I've told you that what we want to learn in financial reporting basically is how to prepare and present financial statements. Is how to prepare all of these things. Is what we want to teach you. Now, I'll come there. So the next thing I should go immediately is to go into how these statements, how they look like. So today I'll be showing you statement of financial position, statement of profit or loss, statement of changes in equity, and we'll look at some questions where you see how notes are presented. So we won't look at the part of notes that is significant accounting policies. Today is not for that, but later you will learn that accounting policies are usually presented in the notes, but today's focus is not that. However, there is something they call general features of a financial statement. I will leave you for to this one to go and study it. If you want to, you might. If you don't want to, you can simply ignore it, right? Because... Majorly along the line, we will talk on 
almost all, we have even talked on some of them. Like when I was teaching you the conceptual framework, I can remember I talked about going concern. Going concern was talked about in chapter three of the conceptual framework, which is that a company will continue to operate into the foreseeable future. That's the assumption we use when preparing financial statements. And I can remember also, I talked about accrual basis of accounting in chapter one, when I explained financial information to you. I told you that this financial information is going to be prepared on an accrual basis. And also, we have talked about one way or the other comparative information. I told you about comparative information, and I was talking about how to ensure predictive value. One of the information or ways we make financial information have a predictive value is by providing comparative information, which means that if you are presenting your financial statement for 2020 or 2024, let's use the current year, you must ensure you provide information also for 2023. That's comparative information. And consistency of presentation, I talked about this also under chapter two of the conceptual framework, where we were talking about comparability. And I told you that before we can achieve comparability, two things must happen. One is consistency of presentation. And the second one is disclosure of accounting policy. So consistency of presentation here is not saying that that you must ensure that you apply the same method year in, year out. Also, this fair presentation and compliance with FRS, I, this is looking at that. When you're presenting your financial statements, you must ensure that you comply with IFRS, which you will start learning from today. Then materiality and aggregation, that only material items should be presented separately. Items that are no material, you need to aggregate those ones and join them together. And offsetting is that don't offset. We don't offset assets and liabilities. You don't offset income and expenses. You present all of them separately on their own right. So you can quickly look at all of these things, all of these things. So it's not an area I can really ask that much, but all the short notes are here that you can quickly look at. Now, that's not our focus for today. Our focus for today is to really look at the structure and the content of these statements. And the first statement we're looking at is the statement of financial position. And this statement of financial position, from what you can see here, the first item here is assets and you have non-current assets after that. And under non-current assets, you have property, plant, and equipment, you have goodwill, you have other intangible assets, we have investments in associates, we have financial assets. All these are under non-current assets. They will not have current assets. They have inventories, trade receivables, other current assets, and cash and cash equivalent. Then by the time they add this non-current asset and all these current assets together, we have our total assets. The first thing I need you to note here is this. You will see that first is that these assets are classified based on they separated the ones that are current assets from the ones that are non-current assets. They separated those two. And this is a method that is recognized by IES1, that you should present your assets based on current, non-current. Then the question is that, how do you know which one is current and which one is non-current? See, over time, you are going to get used to that, so it will be very easy to distinguish. But IES1 says that a current asset is an asset that you expect to realize within one year. An asset that you expect to realize within one year is your current assets. Or, or specifically, they said an asset that you expect that you are going to realize it within your operating cycle. Every entity has an operating cycle, which is a period of when an entity starts and finishes a transaction. That's an operating cycle. 
So when you expect to get money from an asset, when you expect to enjoy economic benefit from an asset within one year or within your operating cycle, then that particular asset is a current asset. And those are things like inventory, trade receivables, cash, and all of that. So the standard did not define non-current assets, but it states that any asset that is not a current asset, automatically that asset becomes a non-current asset. So it's now left to your judgment to decide which one is current, which one is non-current, depending on the definition they have given us for current, which is an asset we expect to realize within one year or within the entity's operating cycle. Okay, so you see, after today now, we'll start picking all of these things one by one. The first standard or the first thing I'll teach you will be property, plant, and equipment. I will teach you how to determine the figures, how to put them in the books, majorly how to recognize and measure them. Then we will teach you about goodwill. We will teach you about intangible. All of these items here, you are going to learn how to determine their figures one by one. The focus for today is not how to determine the figures yet. The focus today is just to introduce you to this template for you to get familiar with it. Now, let's leave assets a bit. That's the first part of your statement of financial position, which the first part gives you a total asset. The second part of your statement of financial position is your equity and liabilities. And it starts with equity. So, and this equity, we have share capital, retain earnings, and other components of equity. Then there is non-controlling interest. So, when you learn group account, you know that, you understand what non-controlling interest is. And you understand that non-controlling interest is also equity because they are part owner of the business also. Just that they don't have control of the business. So they are just non-controlling interest. And today, I will tell you about other components of equity. I will show you that today, but just be patient. Just know that there is something called other component of equity that is usually under equity. So this is the equity part of your statement of financial position, your share capital, your retained earnings, and other components of equity. That gives us our total equity. Then let's go to liabilities. Liabilities too. There is non-current liabilities, which are long-term borrowings, defer tax, and long-term provisions. And there is current liabilities, which are trade and other payables, short-term borrowings, current portion of long-term borrowings, current tax, and short-term. So you will see that liabilities too are classified into current and are non-current. They are the same way asset was classified, current and non-current. For the current, the items you put here are items that you are expected to pay or settle within one year. You put them in your current liabilities. The Any item that you are not expected to settle within one year must go to non-current liabilities. That is how you determine that. But as we move on, you will get used to which one goes to current and which one goes to non-current. So one thing we are learning here today is that your statement of financial position is presented based on current, non-current distinction. Why? Because your assets is classified into current, non-current. Your liabilities is classified into current, non-current. And you will see that your total assets here must always be equal to your total equity and liabilities you have at the end here. They must balance. They must be the same. Now, moving forward, moving forward is that what I just needed to note is not really that important is that using current non current, you will see that the assets start from PP and it ends with um, cash and cash equivalent is not so important. But what is just key that I need you to note is this it is not all companies that present their statement of financial position this way. 
there are some other entities that don't present it this way. And typical of those entities are those entities in financial services industry. Those like banks, like banks, those companies, we it's difficult for us to determine their operating cycle because we can identify when a transaction starts and ends. Like for banks now, the day you open, the day you open an account with the bank, you have started transaction with them and it doesn't end. It will just continue. You'll be doing different type of transactions with them. When you deposit, your money can be there for as long as you want. So usually companies in banking, right? They don't arrange their assets and liabilities based on current, non-current. They don't. The way those ones arrange theirs is, the IS1 says they can choose order of liquidity. Order of liquidity. So you will see that for those companies, their assets will start from highly, highly liquid assets. Where items like cash and cash equivalent, in fact, the current asset will start from first. You will see cash and cash equivalent starting first. Before I continue, can you confirm that I can continue? Yes, you can. Okay, okay good. Okay, so uh, like I was saying, this is how this is what they were asking in the exam, the way this thing is presented, right? Because accounting for banking, probably nobody has ever asked that. Nobody has ever asked that. It used to be in your syllabus, basically for for bank and other financial institution, how to prepare account for them. But now they have just removed it. That when you understand this one, then to know that will be straightforward. But I just need you to note that for entities in financial services, specifically those in banking, they usually present their assets and their non-current assets in order of liquidity. So the highly liquid one will start first. Then in that order, then you find out that the last asset is going to be PPE. Unlike this one, where you start with PPE, under non-current assets and under current assets we end with cash and cash equivalent. This is common for entities that have a defined operating cycle. Okay, so that is the statement of financial position. And this is how it looks like. You will get used to it as we move on in our study. Now, the next one is the statement of comprehensive income. So the first thing I need you to note in this statement of comprehensive income is that it can also be called statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. So some people will just join it together and call it statement of comprehensive income. In fact, conceptual framework under chapter, chapter seven, under presentation and disclosure, it even allow that you can even call it statement of financial performance. But in this class, I would call it often statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. But you know that they could call it some other names too. So, and this statement, majorly what you will find there are basically income and expenses. And the first item you always find there is revenue. Then you remove your direct costs, which is cost of sales. Then you have your gross profit. This is a published account. This is a published account. So you are not expected to be, this, this cost of sales on the face of your account, you are now doing opening stock, plus purchases, minus closing stock. No, you don't do that in a published account. That is going to be done in the notes. That is what the notes are meant for. So, after your gross profit, you get your other income. And other income are things like rent received, discount received, and other items like this. Maybe gain on disposal of an asset, those kind of things. So other income are just items that are not your primary line of operations that you made some money from. Okay, those are other income. 
Then after your other income, you have your distribution costs, your admin expense, and other expenses. Okay, so when you have that, then you deduct your finance costs. Then they will still teach you this share of profit of associates. You learn this. Then you get your PBT, your profit before tax. Then you remove your income tax, which is 4417. I think you have been taught income tax. Mr. Kazim taught you that. I think it took him almost two classes. So when they say income tax, I know that by now you know the income tax are majorly your current tax and your deferred tax. We are going to learn all of that as we move forward. Now, then after you deduct that, then you get your profits from continuing operations or profit for the year. So we are still going to learn about this continuing operations and all of that. Well, for now, let's just pretend as if this continuing operation and discontinuing operations are not there because I don't want to divert to that for now. Then you have your profit for the year. You have your profit for the year. One thing is um, this template, ordinarily when I start teaching you, after this other expenses here, before that um, finance costs, I will have gotten something a profit before then, which we call operating profits or your profit before interest and tax. I will have gotten that before I deduct my finance cost. But you will see as we progress in this class. So that's the statement of profit or loss. Then after that is your statement, your other comprehensive income, your other comprehensive income. And examples of items in other comprehensive income are exchange difference on translation of, um, of foreign operation, available for sale financial assets, a cash flow edges, gain on property evaluation, actual gains on defined benefits plan, all of this. Please, you all of this is just a general template you are not learning most of this. This exchange difference on translation now, you are going to learn it in corporate reporting. Available for sale financial assets is not something we are learning here. A cash flow edges is not something we are learning. It's the only thing that is within your syllabus at uh, financial reporting is this gain on property revaluation. We're going to spend a lot of time of our time studying this probably from next week. If I know probably from next week, Saturday, I will start teaching you about evaluation when I start IS 16. Actual gains, I'm not teaching you that yet. Mod is teaching you that yet. Then share of other comprehensive income of associates, maybe they will teach that. I, I doubt it. The only thing you are learning here is gain on property evaluation. Then let me focus on that. Then the question is this. Why is this gain on property evaluation? Why did they come and put it under other comprehensive income because it's gain on property evaluation. Why didn't they put it here, like under other income? So the reason is that I've taught you before when I was teaching you conceptual framework that items that go to other comprehensive income are unrealized income, unrealized gains. And a typical example of an unrealized gains is gain on property revaluation. And it's just like you have a building that you want to value. You just want to get what's the market value today. So in your books, you have that building as, let's say, 10,000. Then you now call the valuer to help you get the market value. The guy said, ah, it is now 15,000. That 5,000 becomes a, a revaluation surplus or a gain on property revaluation. That kind of gain is not a gain you want to put in your other income that will constitute part of your profit for the year. That kind of gain is a gain that can reverse. That kind of gain is, is a gain that you cannot readily distribute to shareholders as dividend. And that is why those kind of gains we have separated them from your statement of profit or loss 
we have now gone to put them in our other comprehensive income. And all of this gain, you will learn when I teach year 16, these gains usually go and they end up in equity. In fact, all of these items in OCI, they end up in equity because they are reserves. We just go and put them there that any day it reverse. Maybe something happened now. We now went to the market again to get the value of our assets. We saw that the value is now 9,000. It won't be a problem. We will just go and reverse it from the reserve. You will learn all of that. So, but what you are learning specifically in financial reporting is just this gain on property revaluation. That is what I'll teach you under other comprehensive income. Okay. But these other, these, the upper part is something we're going to get used to from the revenue to the profit for the year. That we would get used to. But for this other comprehensive income, the only one that is relevant to us here is the gain on property revaluation. Okay, so that's the statement of, of profit or loss. Now, I have another statement of profit or loss here that is another format. Another format. I will not focus on that. I will not focus on that. Though IS 16 says that you can present your POL by classifying your expense either by function or classifying your expense by nature. I will not, I, is this not an area that, that I can has really gone into? So I won't waste, I won't waste your time teaching you all of that. But I mean, just know that. This particular one we're going to focus on is one that we classify our expense by function. That is cost of sales, distribution costs, and admin. So those are all the expenses we have. And we have classified all of them by function. But this other template classify expense by nature, looking at raw materials, work in progress and finished goods, staff costs, and all of that. So most entities use these ones. And this is one I can expect you to know in the exam. So that's your statement of profit or loss. So finally is the statement of changes in equity. Now, this is a very big statement of changes in equity. We will not learn up to this point at all. So this statement of changes in equity, you will find out that as, um, as we move on, you find out that before I prepare my statement of financial position, I will first prepare my statement of changes in equity. And the reason is that all these items, so I will concentrate on share capital, retain earnings, and evaluation surplus. This translation of foreign operation available for C. You know, I told you that all those items in OCI, all these items here in OCI. I told you that all of them are transferred to equity. You will see that all of them are here. This is how we, it is through the statement of changes in equity that would transfer all of those items in OCI to equity. So as soon as they come here, they become reserved. But our focus in those OCI, like I told you earlier, is going to be revaluation surplus. So this statement of changes in equity is just a statement that shows your like a reconciliation of your equity between the beginning and the end. So in this class, we'll look at majorly share capital, retain earnings, maybe share premium, and other reserves, then the evaluation surplus. So evaluation surplus becomes part of equity too. So all we're just going to look at majorly, this is opening, so I will just ignore this opening part for 2016 year. I'll focus on this 2017, which is for the year. For the share capital, we just look at the movement. Equity looks at the movement in your share capital. And what increases your share capital is if there is issue of share capital. When a company's issue share capital, that will increase their share capital. So this will come in as an addition. The retain earnings. What make your retain earnings to change? Because that's what we are looking at, changes in equity. What makes your retain earnings to change is when you make profit. When you make profit, that's one. That's this 
TCI is the total comprehensive income. This total comprehensive income here. This is the total comprehensive income. This total comprehensive income comprise your profit for the year and all these other all these other ones that happen, this other comprehensive income. So all of them. The one that comes to the TCI is the profit for the year. This 96,600 is not, is not arranged in that other year. So is the 96,600 is the profit for the year that increases your retained earnings. And what decreases your retained earnings is dividend. Is your dividend. When we get to IS 16 also, you are going to learn this transfer to retained earnings. You see that this 200 was an addition to retained earnings and it was a deduction in your evaluation surplus here. You will learn that in IS 16, that we usually transfer evaluation surplus to retained earnings. And I've told you before, I've told you before, on that when I was teaching you recycling, I told you that we, we, we usually recycle items of OCI to either POL or retain earnings. And you recycle them when they become realized. When they become realized. And I told you that I revaluation surplus is never recycled or transferred to PL. I told you that it is transferred directly through retain earnings. And this is how we do it. We come and do that in the statement of changes in equity by removing it from evaluation with surplus. That's why this last item of 200 here, they removed it from evaluation surplus and it came to add it in retain earnings. Okay, so me, this is just a general template. You are still going to look at specific items that we need to focus on. Okay, so for today, these are the three statements I would um, I would stop at. The statement of changes in equity, the statement of profit or loss, and the statement of financial position. Now, the statement of cash flows, that one you are still going to learn that. You are going to learn that as a separate topic as a separate topic under IS7, so I'm not going to talk about that here. Now, the next thing is this. There are a lot of stories. This one was talking about current, non-current classification. You can look to it if you want to. And it was explaining all of these things I've talked about. Now, the next thing I want to look at is these templates that we have looked at. Let's look at how do you prepare a simple statement, a simple statement in, in an exam scenario? So usually your question one in the exam is always going to be published. They will give you a trial balance and they will ask you to prepare um, some statements. So what I want to teach you today is not that level yet because we have not really learned a accounting standard and some other things that can help us to do that. So the first one here is just presentation. So here, what I just want you to understand is when you have a trial balance, you need to be able to know where each items go based on the templates we have looked at. So we're going to look at this question that required us to prepare um, they say you are required to prepare a statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, a statement of financial position, and also statement of changes in equity. So the first thing when you are giving a trial balance is that first you need to come and look and be sure that your trial balance balance. They have to balance. If they don't balance, that means your statement of financial position is not going to balance. Then the next thing is this, they will mostly give you in preliminary form like this. On the left side, represent the debits. They might put it there, they might not put it there, but you have to know that this is the debit side. And on the right side, represent, represent um, the credit. Now, before I continue, I want to test your knowledge a bit. So in this trial balance now, what items do you find would you most likely find on the debit? And what items would you find on the credits in a trial balance? 
you don't have to talk. You can just type your answers in the chat section. What items are usually on the credit and what items are usually on the debits of a trial balance? Anybody? Okay. So Abiodu said income credits, payable debits. Payable is not debit, payable is credit also. Um yeah. Chinedu said expense debit, income credit, asset debit. Okay, that's more like it. Okay, that's more like it. So remember when I taught you element of financial statements, there are five elements of financial statements. There is assets, liabilities, income, expenses, and equity. Those are five elements. And when I was teaching you that, I told you everything we are going to learn in reporting is all about that. I hope you guys have read it. You're not reading these things. That conceptual framework is extremely important. Go and sit down and read it very well. So, and on the debits, what you find on the debits, like um, I think Oyeka was close. What you find on the debits are basically, you find um, expenses and assets on the debits. Expenses and your assets debits on the credit side what you find there are equity income and liabilities that is what you find on the credit income equity and liabilities you find those ones on the credit i hope you never forget this again it's important now Looking at these statements, let us prepare our statement of profit or loss. So you will see that I have I've done it here just for to make our class easy. And usually, this question, this one is very straightforward. It's not a difficult question. So we can usually when I'm solving question on statement of on this published. We usually start with my workings in most cases. We start with our workings. Please give me a few seconds. Okay, sorry. So now, because this question is straightforward, I'll I'll be referring back to these notes later because it's straightforward. So let me just leave them for now. So let me go to my statement of profit or loss first. Let me go to my statement of profit or loss, 
And the first item in statement of profit or loss is your revenue, which is 226,000. And where you find that is your trial balance. You find revenue of 226,000. Then after that, the next item is your cost of sales. Cost of sales. And if you go to your square balance, you will see your cost of sales here. You will see that it's on the debit of 140,000. In some questions, they will not give you straight on like this. They will break it down for you so that you can collate it and examine it yourself. But mostly, most questions are going to be presented this way. Most questions, if not all now going forward. But for now, let's just concentrate on what we are doing, 140,000. By the time you do your revenue minus your cost of sales, you have your gross profit of 86,000. This minus this gives you 86,265. Then other income, you will see that I put note one here. This one in bracket means note one. Um, why? Because there are more than one other income. And one of the other income, can you identify any other income here? You don't have to talk, now just type it. There are like two other incomes here. Can you identify them? Other income, other income. Okay. I can find one already. And I can find the second one. Okay. So I'm waiting for you. Which I from this trial balance now, can you identify other income here? Other income. Okay, Abiodun said rental income. That is correct. So rental income of two five. That is correct. So is there any other one? Apart from rental income. I would advise you that you all participate. If you are just seated there looking, you just sleep. You know you are not in class. This is virtual. So even if you are not correct, nobody cares whether you are correct or you are not. Everybody is learning here. So that is not the ability to identify rental income. There are still other ones here apart from other apart from rental income. Okay, Abiodun said discount received. That is correct. But how much is the discount received? If you say discount received, because I can see discounts here. There's a discount here, this final item here. And there's 3,000 on the debits, and there's 2,000 on the credits. Yeah, nice one, nice one. So that's correct. So is this, this 2,000 that is the discount received. This two thousand that is the discount received, and those are the only two other income we have. So when I ask you other income, when I already told you that um, what you find on the credit are majorly income, liabilities, and equity. So when we talk about other income, you should not even look be looking at this debit at all. Your eyes should be on all of these items that are on the credits. Then from there you'll be able to know which is other income. 
Debilization is not other income. Revenue is not other income. Share capital is not other income. Allowance for doubtful debt is not other income. Trade um trade payables is not other income. Rentals, yes, other income. Bank balance on the credit is not other income. Preference is not other income. The fact that is not. Revaluation reserve is not. Retain earnings is not. It's the discount that is under income. So, and that's my first note here. Other income. I, I have rental income from investment property to five. I have discount received 2,000. Then total for five. Then this total is what I will transfer to my statement as other income. Of four five, so you will see that it is not allowed for you to now on this statement now put discount received and that rental income. No, it's not allowed. You don't. That's why they, that's what they call aggregation. When I was teaching you general features, you don't. There are some items that you just have to aggregate together and get a single item. So mostly, you would show the breakdown of these items in the notes. That is what the notes is meant for. Okay, so that's other income. After other income, the next item is administrative expenses. So we go to our car balance and look for our administrative expenses. And these administrative expenses of 26,200. So usually there might be other, other items here that might be added to the administrative expenses. But in this instance now, we don't have any item of administrative expenses here. There is no item that fits into the administrative expenses. One that can fit in is this discount allowed. But I added that as part of your distribution cost. If you, you can add it to admin too, so the examiner will not penalize you. But I added it as part of my distribution cost. So I have my admin, nothing to add to it. So I go to my POL. Administrative expenses, I have it as 26,200. Then I have my distribution expenses. That's the next item there. I go to my trial balance. I search for my distribution expenses and I have it here as 12,300. And that is not the only item there. Other items of distribution expenses, I've told you already. We have um, we have discount allowed, which is three thousand, and that's why I have at these distribution expenses as my note two. So based on my trial balance, my distribution expense was twelve thousand three hundred. Then there's additional one of discount allowed, which is three thousand. The addition of the two gives me 15,300. So I go to my statements. I have my distribution expenses, which is 15,300. 15, okay. Then after you have deducted your admin expense, then you will now get what we call your profit before interest and tax, PBIT, which is otherwise called operating profits. So by the time you do this 86,625, you add your 45, you deduct 26,200, you deduct 15,300, you will get your PBIT of 49,625. Then after that, you are going to have our finance costs. And from here, what do you have as finance costs? Is there any finance cost here? So there's a finance cost here of 5,500. There's a finance cost here of 5,500. So I will come here. I'll have my finance cost 5,500. By the time I deduct my finance costs for my profit before interest and tax, then I will get my profit before tax, which is 44,125. 44,125. Then after that, I'll deduct my income tax 
So my income tax basically comprise my current tax and my defer tax. In this trial balance, do we have any current or defer tax? Guys, you have to participate. Can't just sit down here and be looking. Do you have any different tax here? Okay, so I need I need you to unmute and um, I need you to tell me whether this four thousand two that you have here, since I know that you have done income tax, can because you will see this four thousand two. I did not put it here. I did not put it in my PNL. And income tax comprises. Defer tax on current tax. Why didn't I put this for two as part of my income tax? And since I didn't put it there, where will I put it? I need somebody to tell me. You have done IS 12. So you should know this. Okay. Hello, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. Chill, do. Sorry, I'm on charge that barely follow up. For income tax, the remaining part will go to like a statement of financial position as liability. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. Sorry, so, I'm on charge it. I'm not really following where. Sir. Sorry, I'm on Okay, no I'll problem. No problem. Uh, that is correct. So this default tax is going to come in as a non-current liabilities. And why this one is not going to your, your income tax as expense is that, you see, expense will not ordinarily be on the credit side. That's one. The second thing is this. Um, the default tax that go to your income tax is is the movement between the beginning defer tax and the defer tax at the end. So defer tax is such is done in such a way that every year you will get an estimate of your defer tax. So the defer tax you see in your trial balance is the opening defer tax. The opening meaning defer tax estimate from last year. Just, I mean, just note that for now. The different tax you get in your trial balance is the opening, is the one from last year. And why is it that? Is that because different tax is only done, is an estimation of different tax is done at the end of each year. So at the end of each year, you will get a new estimate of your different tax. And as we move on, you will see that how you calculate different tax or your different tax for the end of the year will usually be given in the additional information. It's something they will give you in the additional information. So we don't have additional information in this question that would have given us our closing different tax. What we have here is the opening different tax. So that has nothing to do with what goes to POL is the difference between the opening defer tax and the closing defer tax that goes to your POL. So this one is not going to go there. And that is why it, we did not show it there. Okay, just take that one and keep it for now. 
As we move on, we'll unfold other things that you need to know. Again, defer tax is something you calculate at the end of each year. So at the end of each year, we'll get an estimate of our defer tax. The defer tax we find in the trial balance is the opening from last year, the one they calculated last year that they now brought forward to this year. That is the defer tax you will always find in the trial balance, except the examiner otherwise stated it and they put a date that these different tasks will lead to the end of the year, except that. Otherwise, is the first assumption is that, ah, this is the different tax brought forward. The different tax that goes to your p &L is the change between the beginning different tax, which you find in your, in your trial balance, and the closing different tax, which is the estimate of different tax for the year, which you will always find in the additional information. In this question, we don't have any additional information because I'm just barely introducing you to how to prepare this statement now. So it's the difference between the beginning and the end that goes to p &L. Don't worry, we don't have that scenario yet, but we are going to see all of that very soon. Okay, so that's the, the story around why we don't have any income tax here. Then we have our profit for the year, which is 44,125. Then after profit for the year, you have your other comprehensive income, your other comprehensive income, and other, your other comprehensive income. I told you the only item we will learn for OCI is revaluation surplus. That's the only item we're going to learn in this class. And you will see that I, I don't have any item of evaluation surplus here. Let's go to our statement and see why. But if you look at this trial balance, you will see that there was a revaluation reserve here of 20,000. And you will notice that I did not put it there. The reason is this. Revaluation surplus, again, the revaluation surplus for the year they will not give you in the trial balance because it's something they would mostly tell you how you're going to derive it at the end of the year and that they will give you in the additional information. The revaluation you find in the trial balance is the revaluation brought from last year. Remember, I told you that items of OCI, they go to equity. They go to equity and become a reserve. It's a reserve that they will continue to carry forward. So this one is a revaluation reserve relating to previous periods brought forward. So this one does is not the revaluation surplus for this year. The revaluation surplus that come to your p &L is the revaluation surplus that happened this year. And that they will give you the additional information. So this one you are seeing here is not a candidate for POL, but rather is an equity. You will just go and go to my statement of changes in equity and how it will become the opening or the board forward for that item. And that settles that. So since we don't have evaluation surplus, then we'll have total comprehensive income as this value here. And ends my statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Then I told you that I would always present my statement of changes in equity before I present my statement of financial position. Because this statement of change in equity will have determined my equity for me to have determined my equity, which I will just go and use in my equities part of my statement of financial position. So my statement of changes in equity, I have my name, my title, and the date, and the date. And you will see the way, one thing you should have noticed is the way I always put the name, the title, and the date. The same way I put it here, the name, the title and the date is extremely important. 
Don't ever prepare a statement without putting the name of the entity or the reporting date for the year ended. This one too for the year ended. Okay. So my equity that I have here, I have my share capital. I have my retained earnings. I have my evaluation reserve. How do I know that it is these three I have? The way you will know is from your trial balance. So if you focus on the credit of your trial balance, you can easily know which items of equity do you have. So these are the items on the credits, depreciation, revenue, ordinary shares. You see I have ordinary shares here. Allow allowance for receivables, no. No, no, no. You can treat this one as ordinary shares, but I'm going to treat it as a liability, so let me leave it. You can treat this as equity, but I'll treat it as liability, this preference shares. Then I have my evaluation reserve here, and I have my retained earnings here. So that's how I know that there are three items of equity. So this one is the opening share capital. 40,000. This one is the opening revaluation reserve and this is the opening retained earnings. So let's start with the share capital. The ordinary share capital at, of 50 cover each was 40,000. So the share capital at 40,000. My retained earnings. I have 16.5. My retain earnings, where is it? Yeah. Retain earnings. 16.5. Then my evaluation reserve is 20,000 here. So I have my evaluation reserve under here, opening 20,000. So these are, so you see that the items of equity in the trial balance were the opening equity. If I add these three together, I have a total of 76,500. Second thing is that, what will increase your, your share capital is if there is um, issue of shares. And that they can only give you the additional information. And here, we don't have any additional information. So that's why we don't have any increase here. So the 40,000 at the end, which is balance carried forward, is just the 40,000. Nothing else to add. Then secondly, is my retained earnings. What increases your retained earnings is your profit for the year. Okay, which is this 44125. This 44125. Then I have my total 44125. If I add these two together, this 165 and 44125, I have my total retained earnings as 6625. Then my evaluation reserve. In the trial balance, I have opening as 20,000. We don't have any revaluation reserve for the year. So zero is still 20,000. If I add these three together, I have 120,625. But if you add these two together, it's going to give you the same thing. And that's my statement of changes in equity. So this statement of changes in equity, when I'm preparing my statement of financial position, I will just pick these items and transfer it. I won't have to think or calculate it again since I've already done it here. Then finally, is my statement of financial position. Again, the name of the entity, the title of the statements, and the reporting dates is very important. It's only a statement of financial position that we present as, as at year ended. The other ones are for the year ended. For the year ended. POL, for the year ended. Statement of changes in equity. And again, I don't joke with my negative sign. 
And you see there's this command millions level of earning of, and I have to put that. And you see the figures in my trial balance, that was how the examiner also has put it, command millions. So that means this 13,875 we are seeing here, it means there are six zeros behind it, six zeros. So this is not just 13,875, this is like 13 billion. 13 billion because there's six eight seven five zero 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 zero. That's what this command million means. When you are preparing your statements, even in my notes, you see that I don't joke with million. I'm putting it there because if I don't put it there and I just put 12,300, it means 12,300. And you are wrong. You don't joke with all of these little details. Okay. So let's go to my statement of financial position. I've put my nearer sign and uh, the million sign. Then I have my asset, non-current assets. The first item I have here under my assets is my land and building. So let me go to my trial balance. My trial balance, you see I have my land and building here on the debits and it's 62,000. So let me see my land and building, 62,000. The next one is my plant and equipment. This is my plant and equipment. So my my plant and equipment is uh, is fifty thousand. You will see that they put this date here. This is as at the beginning of twenty twenty. Later, you are going to understand that these assets here, they are always at costs or at revalued amounts. You understand that very soon. They are always at cost. You understand that very soon. Not today, though, when we do a PPE. This land and building that even that I, that I talked about is also at cost. So plant and equipment, 50,000. I will transfer it to my statement of financial position, 50,000. The deducted accumulated depreciation of 13,875. So, and that is gotten from here. Deposition of plant and equipment, 13875 So you see that is on the credit, and it is the accumulated deposition. You understand it very well. As we move on, when you get to IS-16, you won't understand all of that. But so, and that is that 13875 So I have my 13875 here. They accumulated everything, this plus this minus this. I have 98125. But the challenge is this. It's not a challenge. It's just, it's just we thinking. I have land and building, 62,000. They didn't give me accumulated depreciation. But plant and equipment, they gave accumulated depreciation. It's two reasons why. One is that it's because usually land is not depreciated. And two, from what I can see, this is a revaluation reserve on the land and building. So that means that probably they just revalued this land and building. And when they revalue land and building or any assets, you will not find accumulated depreciation there. It will have been eliminated. I know you don't understand that now, but you understand it later. But I mean, Let's focus on the fact that we don't have accumulated deposition here. So let's ignore. But we have accumulated deposition for plant and equipment, which we have deducted. Aside that, there's this multi-user SP accounting software 57. That's an intangible asset. And that is why it's coming next here. This one, 5,700. And after that one, we had an investment property. We have an investment property, and that's why that one also is coming 
is here investment property this is it 15000 investment property that is also coming as non current assets 15000 and that's everything we have as non current assets if we had 98125 plus 57 plus 15000 we will get 118825 then the next one is my current assets. The first item I put here is plant held for sale. And this is it. So a plant that is held for sale, usually I will teach you this under IFRS 5. Then you understand that when you have an asset that you hold for sale, and usually when you have an asset, the intention is always that you want to use it for your production or for your supply. If your intention now change and you decide that you don't want to use it for that use anymore, that what you want to use it for now is to sell. So that particular asset will now come under non under current asset. And that is why this plant held for sale of 7.5 is coming under, under current assets because the entity wants to sell it immediately. Remember, current assets is an asset or items you're expected to realize within one year. Then the next one here is inventory. So we have my inventory here of 10,000. That's my closing inventory. I know that it's closing because of these dates. 31st December 2020, because that's the year end of 10,000. That's my inventory of 10,000. Then I have my trade receivables. You will see that they deducted allowance for receivables of 2,000. Let's go and confirm that in the trial balance. So in my trial balance, I have my trade receivables, 10,000. Then they now deducted allowance for doubtful debts of 2000. So now you are knowing that when you have <laughs> when you have an allowance for doubtful debt, it is usually deducted from your trade receivables. Because what allowance for doubtful debt means is that we are saying 2000 of our trade receivable might not pay, might. Allowance for doubtful debt is different from bad debts. They are different. They are not the same thing. Bad debt, that one has failed to pay. It's, it's gone. But allowance for doubtful debt, that one might still pay. But we are just saying it might not pay. We are just making an estimate just to be prudent. Okay? So usually when you are preparing your statement of financial position, you you do your credit receivable, you remove your allowance for receivables or that food debt from that. And that's why we are having 10,000 minus 2,000. Then that gives us 8,000. So by the time you add your current assets to your non-current assets, we're going to have a total asset of 144,325. Now, at the other side is the equity and liabilities. The first item here is equity. So this one, you don't have to stress yourself. Just go and pick all these figures from your statement of changes in equity. Just go and pick it from there. So my share capital, 40,000. Within any, 66,25. Revaluation reserve, 20,000. And that's what I just came to put here. 40,000, 62,25, and 20,000. Then it gives me a total of 126.25. Okay, so preparing your statement of change in equity before your statement of financial position makes your work a little easier. When you get to the equity, equity part of your statement of financial position, you just pick this um these closing figures, and that's it. Then after that is my non-current liabilities. And the items I have here, I have my preference share capital of 13,000, and I have my default tax of 4,200. 
all I picked for my trial balance, my preference share capital, 13,000, defer tax, 4,200. Those are the only items of non-current liabilities that we have here. 13,000, 4,200. So that gives me 17,200. Then my current liabilities, here I have my trade payables and my bank overdraft, 3,035. You go and check your trial balance, my trial balance. I have my trade payables. Trade receivables slash trade payables is the payables that will be on the credit. And my bank balance that is here was on the credit. That makes it a bank overdraft. Anytime you see bank balance on the credit, is a bank overdraft. So, and those are the two items there. Those are the two items here. 3,035. When I add these two together, it gives me 65. When you add this 126.25 to this 7,200, to this 6,500, it gives me 144,325, which is the same thing as these total assets. They must be the same. That means your account has balanced. So you see, by implication, there is no item in this trial balance that we have not touched. We have touched everything. And what you have learned indirectly is that you now know where each of them belongs. So you will see that this deposition, we deducted it from the plant and equipment because it's an accumulated deposition. This one went to POL, this one to POL, this one to current asset, this one to POL, like that. We distributed everything to where they belong. And that is what I just want you to learn here today how to use your trial balance to prepare these statements. Now, I have done this for you. You have these materials already with the solution. What I need you to do very, very importantly is this question two. Please and please, I know the solution is there. And you have the solution here. But if you want to help yourself, kindly do it yourself first before you check the solution. So I'm giving you this question two as assignment. Attempt it yourself first before you check the solution. So question two is just similar to what we have done. All the statements. I think there's another question here. A question three. Attempt that too. So is that all? I think the solution is there. And there's question four. I think it stops at question four. Yeah, question four is the last question there. 